Good morning and welcome to the Tech Talk today. My name is Mason Egger. Um, if you have any questions, as they said, leave as I said, leave them in the questions box. But if you just want to connect with me uh, outside of Tech Talks, feel free to follow me at Twitter. I have websites and emails. I do a Twitch live stream where I do a lot of lot of the open source coding work that I do. Um, I do on there, so feel free to come and join me on that uh, if you're so inclined. And Today's webinar goals are um, are as follows. We are going to learn about the different tactics to secure your droplet. I am going to demonstrate how to implement some of these tactics uh, on your own droplet. For the demonstrations, I will be using uh, Ubuntu 20.04. So while that may not be the operating system that you're using, some of these are pretty universal. Some of them are standard Unix commands that really don't matter if it's between different Linux distros. One or two of them may be specific to Ubuntu, but the concepts themselves are relatively the same. So you don't really have to worry about that. And this webinar will be going over um, a community tutorial that we have on our website. This is basically, basically just me discussing this uh, tutorial and just demoing some of the stuff live. We have a great tutorial called Recommended Security Measures uh, to Protect Your Servers. I highly recommend you uh, check it out. We'll make sure that whenever we email it out to you, uh, the information about this tech talk after the fact we will send it to you in the process so without any further ado we're going to go ahead and start with our one of the first recommended tips for S for securing your servers and that is using ssh keys to authenticate so currently when you create a droplet you have the option of either using an ssh key to uh secure your server so that way you can log in via keys or you can use a password um, password authentication is considered a more risky and more insecure way to authenticate to just about anything. Um, if, in reality, if I could, I would I would authenticate via key v to everything. I'd love to see key based off on every website on the face of the planet. It would be great, but we'll see when that happens. And the reason this is more secure is the SSH keys are usually a larger bit length. Um, typically passwords are, you know, eight to 16 characters. You break that down to the amount of bits. It's really not that much versus when you have something say like an RSA key, uh, and you set it to 4,096 bits, that's, that's quite a few more bits. It's a lot more difficult to crack. Um, also these bits are all completely randomized. The SSH key is used on a large system of prime numbers. If you're using RSA and it's not something that you can easily socially engineer out of someone. It's not something you can guess. You don't really guess an SSH key. I can guess uh, someone's password based on maybe some stuff they posted on their Facebook page or through other social engineering techniques. But with SSH keys, it's a lot more difficult to do that. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go ahead and I'm going to demonstrate how to create an SSH key using Linux and just common Unix tools uh, to generate an SSH key and log into a server using it. So on any normal Unix uh, style system, there will be an SSH key gen. Um, Windows has a, uh, has a tool called Putty, which you could find tutorials on on the DigitalOcean site, and I will try to remember to link to those later. But with the new Windows subsystem for Linux, where you can run Ubuntu natively on your machine, um, on your Windows box, if you are using Windows, you actually, in my opinion, I don't even use Putty anymore. I use just the Windows subsystem for Linux. So to create a key, we're just going to do SSH key, key gen dash T for type, RSA dash B. 4096, um, that's still a relatively secure key. There are different types of uh, uh, SSH keys, EC, DSA, um, and others. I still typically choose RSA keys. Uh, at some point I will go and read up about the other keys and stop, but this was just, this is kind of a muscle memory command and it's what I do currently. And dash C, uppercase C, and I usually put my email address uh, here. And what this will do is it will generate a private pair key um, and it will ask you to enter a file where you want to save this. If you haven't generated one already, then you can typically just go ahead and go with the default, which is a ID underscore RSA file in your home directory .ssh folder, which if it did, was not there, it will be created for you. And then a passphrase. A lot of people choose to not use a passphrase. I, for this demo, am not going to, but personally, all of my SSH keys have passphrases. I am very, and they're very long passphrases. And the difference between a passphrase and a password is passphrases are actually supposed to be long and they're supposed to be very, very difficult to guess. Because again, if you have an SSH key and you have a weak password or passphrase on it and someone manages to get the key 
and you have a weak passphrase, you're kind of back in the same situation of just having a, a, root, a user with a weak password. Yes, it's much more difficult to get someone's SSH key. They would actually have to have physical access to your machine to get it, but you still don't want to have a weak passphrase here. So I don't recommend leaving them empty, um, but that is, I will leave that up to you. It just depends. Uh, adding them does make automation around SSH a little bit more complicated, but at the same time, I, again, I don't, I always choose to use a passphrase. So you'll get a random art image of this and you will see that it is as we have saved it. So now what we do is we basically just cat our uh, public key. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to go to, go back to our DigitalOcean control panel and we're just going to go to settings and we're going to go to security. And I'm just going to add a new SSH key. We're going to copy and paste it and we're going to call this SSH key Tech Talks. And now I've added the SSH key correctly. So now when I go to create a droplet, go away notification. When I go to create a droplet, and Ubuntu 2004, we're just going to go with the defaults, uh, San Francisco. I can come down here and I can select my Tech Talks SSH key. So now instead of filling in a one time password and getting a root password, I now have a Tech Talks, um, you, I now have the Tech Talks key and I will create this droplet really quick. I probably should have created a $5 one because it'll create a little bit faster. Um, but we'll wait, we'll wait a little bit on this. And essentially what we would do with this now is we would take it and we would use it to uh, SS SSHN to our machine so that way we can access it. Come on little server, you can do it. There we go. So we take, click and copy the IP address and now we SSHN as root because root is the default user. Uh, you should definitely change this once you get in. Yes, and now we are logged in to that server. Uh, because If I had a passphrase, it would have prompted me for one here, but we used the key and we immediately got in. So SSH keys are good for security because they are much more difficult to crack. They're a lot harder to um, get a hold of than one has to have physical access to your machine. And it's you just it's really difficult to, so, to socially engineer a key out of someone versus socially engineering, like say a password out of someone. So that is the first tip on securing your droplet. From here, we are gonna talk about firewalls. So a firewall is essentially a, in, in, the, in the lowest sense, it is a packet filter. So what it does is it essentially checks and scans traffic that comes in and checks to see if the port that is uh, going in is allowed. If we allow this port to come this uh, in, we will pass it through. And if we don't want it or we don't like it, we simply, we can either flat out reject the, uh, the request, which will immediately send back to the client telling them, hey, this port is closed. Or we can drop the request, which will make the client kind of not, it basically just don't answer. We don't answer the door. The client kind of lingers a little bit, goes, hey, is anybody there? And then eventually it will, the connection will time out and it may try again. Um, which one you use is up to you. I've typically gone more on the drop thing because then they know that you're, they know that you're kind of explicitly blocking a port. Um, and it also kind of wastes the attacker's time a little bit because if they are trying to just port scan you and stuff if they have if everything is being dropped instead of immediately returned back as a no it takes a little bit longer on them so uh, that's always been my field of view i would love to hear y'all's opinion on it um there's definitely different varying thoughts on this so as you can see though uh with this in this diagram it is trying to make a mysql request feature uh to our lamp stack server which would have a mysql port running but we don't want to see people from the outside being able to access it so we disallow it now that is what a firewall is. I would say at its basic levels, a packet filter. Firewalls are continually evolving. Um, there are next generation firewalls that do profiling. There are all sorts of like intrusion detection systems that can be built in. So you, whenever you start learning how to implement firewalls, there's a lot of information. Start at the basics and kind of move your way up. Um, there are tons of really cool features that you can integrate into firewalls. Uh, fail to ban is one of the really cool ones where if somebody tries to 
uh, access it for too many times, eventually just say, no, you don't get to access it for another like hour because we know we kind of think that you're a bot. So that is firewalls. And to talk about firewalls, uh, first we're gonna talk about the local firewall on the droplet. So there's actually two different types of firewalls you can use with your droplet. You can use the operating system specific firewall, or you can actually use DigitalOcean's firewall product, which is free to use to filter at the software level. So that would be filtering at like the, at the hypervisor level and the traffic would just actually never get to you and you would never see it versus just letting all traffic come through and dropping it on your side. So for Ubuntu, this is actually one of the commands that is uh, relatively Ubuntu specific. Um, sudo UFW app list. And as we can see that we currently have open SSH available. So if we were to do, you know, sudo ufw allow open ssh, we would now see, uh, we would now see that. And if we do app list again, that's the available. Um, sudo, if we do sudo ufw enable now, we will now see that we have it set up and UFW app. What is the one? What is the oh status? Oh, pseudo UFW status. And this will show us which firewall rules are active. So say we wanted to install a web server, so apt install nginx. And this will take a little bit of time. So say we wanted to install this. Once this is up and running, our current firewall will not allow connections into it. So what we will have to do in, after this is we'll have to do that at UFW app list again, and we'll have to open connections to this. Um, while we're waiting on this, I guess I'll go ahead and just talk a little bit more. So a lot of people may ask, well, which one's better, the DigitalOcean firewall or the operating system firewall? And the answer is, it depends. Um, they're both very good. They both They both serve their purpose. So the next question that people would typically ask me will be, well, which one do you prefer using? And in reality, if you're really concerned about security, I would recommend both. Security, if you if you saw my last webinar, security is about security and layers. The more layers that we have, the more defenses that we have up to protect ourselves, the better off we're probably going to be. So why only, if you have the option for two firewalls, why only have two? Now, there is the thing where that could potentially impact performance a little bit, depending on uh, the high, the performance of your application. And that is something that I typically say, well, when people ask me about, well, do you think the firewall is going to have negatively affect performance? It's one of those things that if it actually is impacting performance, because firewalls typically run in kernel space, which runs super fast. Um, so if it is impacting you, then you probably know it. Um, the likelihood is, is that it's not going to. Only super, super fast applications. And even at that point, you don't really turn off the firewall for performance. Like you don't, like maybe you'll turn off one or the other if you think that's it. But if you're really high performant, security still matters and you may just have to learn to live with that performance hit. That being said, the performance hit is gonna be so minuscule and so non-existent that I doubt anybody would ever actually see it. I've never seen like firewall performance issues. Um, unless of course you hand rolled your own in Python, uh, which I've seen someone actually implement one for fun as a university project. And the the the, the tag on the GitHub repo was, if it's, uh, if it's really slow, nobody can break in. And it's true. So uh, by the way, I'm a big Python fan. So I'm not, I'm not like knocking Python, but Python would like, if you ever asked me, what should I build a firewall in Python would not be the answer. So we have this fire, we have our, uh, Yes, we have our, come on, no, come back. We have it installed now, and this is called techtalk.shark.codes. Uh, and as you can see, we're not gonna get any traffic to it because the firewall is closed. So if we come back here and we do sudo ufw app list, you will now see that Nginx is, um, is now there, people. It is now recognizing that Nginx is available. Um, so we're gonna do sudo ufw allow nginx full, does that work that way? Uh, probably have to put it in quotes. Why they put stuff in spaces, I don't know. There we go. So now if we do a sudo ufw status, 
you will see that we now have nginx full which i believe means both http and https personally as a designer i would just rather have had just those two and i don't need full um that's kind of confusing to me and our site has now loaded because we have allowed access to the port so that is a that is the operating system level firewall if i wanted to do firewalls at the droplet level i would go to networking then i go to firewalls and i would come over here and basically say we're going to call this tech talk and we're going to allow inbound connections from 22 um I'm going to allow inbound on HTTP and actually, no, we're going to disallow that real quick. Outbound rules, we're allowing all outbound. That's something I could give an entire tech talk about how that might not be the best option for you. Um, but I don't want to get too far off. I... We made a big one, so it's that one. Got to give things better names, Mason. So we create the firewall, and if I come back over here now, firewall is, did I mess it up? Is it applied to the right droplet? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. So, my bloody cache. <laughs> Hopefully I installed it on the right. I think I installed the server on the thing on the wrong server. Ah, I put it on the, okay, I wasn't planning on using that. That's my fault. So I put it on the wrong server. My goodness, if I give things the proper names whenever you create them, you won't have this problem. So if I come over here and I add this, I add the correct droplet to it. We'll just add my other droplet too. So I have a droplet that I'm using to do this tech talk and then I'm spinning up droplets to kind of demonstrate stuff. And now that I have that, as you can see, now it's spinning. It doesn't really know what to do. That is because we have closed the port. Eventually, this connection will time out, and it won't allow us in. So if we come back to this networking section, and we take our firewall, and we go to Tech Talks, and we add HTTP, and we add HTTPS, it will be fine. So we, as you can see, we allow a lot of the just the very common ones that you're going to need. and uh, and then if you need to do a custom one, you can do a custom one. Those are saved. And now this is actually loading the right way as it should. So next topic is going to be virtual private clouds. So if you have been a, a, a user of DigitalOcean for a while now, you will know that these are relatively new for us. Um, in reality, they were actually kind of implemented behind the scenes a long time ago. And that's kind of what the private networking, if you're an old school DL user, um, private networking was kind of based around this. But now we have full support for virtual private cloud. And what a virtual private cloud is, it's essentially a way of you creating a digital data center where you can isolate traffic and very much control all the networking traffic and all the things that happen to droplets with inside of this, I guess, organizational unit with inside this container. And it's actually very good for security because now you can... Like instead of having to worry about just like firewalls on every server, now you have basically what you could consider a large outer casing that basically allows for firewalls and also has a little bit of networking magic in the middle. And again, it's one more layer to it. Our fire, we have firewall at the operating system level. That's the first wall. We have firewall at the DigitalOcean level. Now we put everything inside of a VPC, which technically isn't a firewall. Um, but it does give us the private networking and then we can set up our firewall rules to allow and disallow traffic to the entire virtual private cloud. So the firewall rule that we had where we added individual droplets, what we would do, that would be kind of annoying. Like say I spin up another droplet and I forget to add it to the firewall on the DigitalOcean side. Oh no, like things get through. Instead, I can now apply those firewall rules to the VPC. And as long as I spin up the droplet inside of the VPC, I don't have to worry about uh, applying them to the individual droplets because it's applied to the group as a collective which is very, very nice. So just to go over VPCs a little bit, those are also in networking, I believe, VPC. So what we're going to do is I'm going to create a VPC, a new VPC in San Francisco 3. And as you can see, each region comes with its own default VPC. Um, you cannot change the default VPC. So whenever you are creating your, and the first one you create will be considered the default. So be be careful with how you uh, allocate your IP addresses here because if you make a mistake and it's the default, it can't be changed. Um, 
So I'm going to create a new VPC in San Francisco 3 where my droplets are. Actually, it really doesn't matter where I put them, to be honest. Um, you can have an IP range generated for you. I love uh, CIDR subnets and things like that. So I always generate my own 192.168.92.0. And we're going to give it a slash 24, which will be just 251 addresses. We're going to give it Tech Talk, the name Tech Talk. And we're just going to create a VPC network real quick. And as you can see, where'd it go? I made it in NYC3 because I'm apparently silly and clicked on the wrong button. Either way, it actually doesn't matter. I, I, can, I can work with it being in NYC3. It's not that big of a deal. So when I go to create droplets now, droplets, DBAS, a lot of uh, resources now support it. We're going to do $5 droplets. We're going to say NYC3. And as you can see, it now it will pre-pop based on my data center region. It pre-populates my VPC. So I'm going to select, hey, VPC. Um, we're going to just select all because I'm super lazy. We're going to create three droplets inside of this VPC. And while those are going, we go to networks, we go to firewalls. So what we can do now is we create a new firewall called VPC. And what we can do So what we can do now is we can say all IP addresses within inside of our VPC will have allowed inbound SSH rules, or we can do not, we can, you know, that's all they're going to allow to have. We could also remove this and what we would, we could do is we would, oh, I'm just, 92.0. Oh, I didn't create that. Maybe the droplets aren't done being created yet. Ah, they're still gone. Make sure everything looks good on this side. Yep. So as you can see, we have our VPC, our droplets inside of here. These are the public, the private IP addresses of our droplets, and these are the public IP addresses of our droplets. We have created a VPC network, and we have add resources, and we can configure a, uh, a API gateway. That is one of the cool things now we can do about it. Now let's go back to our firewalls and hope I can figure it out. Um, if I can't, I can pull up some Terraform code that does it because I'll be honest, I do 90% of what I do at DigitalOcean is done through Terraform. So sometimes I'm not always the best at the control panel. So we allow inbound from there. Let me pull up my uh, github.com slash community. Terraform sample architectures. Minimal web stack, and we go to main. Nope, it is in droplets or web servers. Is that what I called it? Yes. So if I pull up this Terraform code, so yes, the source address of the inbound rule, I allow access from the VPC IP range. So what I did up here was correct, is doing it like that, just to make sure. So by allowing inbound and outbound, this set of rules allows all traffic. Um, so that's where you, okay, that's where you would come here and you would basically say, no all IPv4, no all IPv6. That's what I do. Okay, I, I think about it in Terraform rules. So we remove all of that and then we specifically allow inbound rules. So I will allow... As you can see from this Terraform file, um, I allow outbound rules of uh, DNS, UDP, port 53, port 80, port 443, and ping. And then the only inbound rules that I allowed are actually within inside the TCP IP range. So what I would do here is I would actually almost delete this. Like if I, because DigitalOcean droplets don't currently have a, um, a private IP only option, like every droplet will have a public IP, 
everything is allowed inbound. So what I what you do is you kind of remove all of the inbound rules. You let them talk out to the ports that you want them to talk out on. And then what you would end up doing from there is creating a bastion server in the middle. And that allows you to come in and view it. So that's how you would apply rules to a... Uh, so if I did want to allow SSH in, I would remove to my VPC, I would remove the dot zero slash 24. I would remove the, uh, sorry, I would remove all the IPv4, IPv6, make sure that it isn't allowed. And now only, uh, actually only outside sources, actually this, this means that, on, that even still outside sources can't reach these droplets, um, but droplets at, inside of the VPC can SSH into each other. So if I wanted to allow external SSH, I'd have to add that all IPv4, IPv6 back. But because I didn't do that, um, because I did it like this, only the droplet, the droplets inside of them can only talk to each other over SSH. That I could probably do a whole tech talk on VPC. If that's something that you're interested in seeing and like all of that setup, which I think we've already done one, but we could always do another one, uh, leave it in the comments. So that is virtual private clouds. I want to be, we're conservative of time because... I could. I just realized I could talk about virtual private clouds forever. It's a, it's one of. Believe it or not, I actually very much enjoy virtual private clouds. I'll clean that up later. I made a mess, and now I have to go clean it up. So, the next thing that we're going to talk about outside of virtual private clouds is service auditing. So this is very important because if your server is compromised, say some something happens and some sort of botnet gets on there and it downloads a script and then it basically what it's going to have to do is it has to call out to uh, a top node like a, a node that a control node that would basically say hey we're all attacking this person now to do that it has to open up a port and it has to be listening on that port so this is actually where service auditing, auditing comes in handy because you can check to see which uh which services are running and you can automate this obviously but if you run the service audit and there are things running that you are not aware of, then there's probably something wrong and at least somebody needs to investigate that. So we're actually gonna demonstrate that right now. I wish I'd stop clicking before I go out. And what we're gonna do is we're going to run ss-p sudo ss-plunt. And this tells me all of the current connections that are opening open on my system so i have port 53 that's just a udp dns connection because it it does that like that's how just how local i think that's uh looks like it's running on 127 so it might be just local dns resolving on the server on the loopback device um as you can see port 80 is open and port 22 are open to the world um because as our on IPv4 and IPv6 because we have a web server running and we have open SSH running. Now, if you were to run this command and there's some random port open and you're not aware of that service, then I would say you probably need to see what's going on and check it out and make sure that there's nothing listening on a server there that you didn't intend. Um, so that's, that's just one way to do it. There are tons of tools for doing this. Um, if you are planning on automating, this kind of stuff. Uh, you could use tools like server spec or inspec, um, which I think inspec is a fork of server spec. And essentially what these tools do is it allows you to define the state of your services. And then you can basically run this tool and it will go, is port 80 open? Is port 22 open? Uh, are these things running? And then it goes and checks all of these things. And it'll say, yes, these things are running. And you can also do it to check like the negatives, like are only these ports open and if it comes back and throws a warning then you can basically like no wait and you can alert somebody we used to run uh server spec tests on our servers every 15 minutes um just to make sure that the server was still healthy it's a really good way of uh, auditing services but also starting to detect outages and detect when things are starting to break um, so if I was running it and like, I saw that for some reason, the web server was not on, that means that the web server is now not responding and I have a problem. I have a potential outage. We need to figure out what is going on with that. And then basically server spec could talk out to either we were using Datadog, which you can always use Prometheus and Grafana, um, especially if you're doing it open source, uh, and it would reach out and ping somebody and then let some, you know, alert you on Slack and be like, Hey, the web server is not listening on the web port. So you constantly need to be auditing your services, one, just to make sure that you're actually doing something and that what you intend for your service to do is actually working. And two, to make sure there's nothing going on that you aren't aware of. 
So that's service auditing. Unattended updates. So this one is almost a slight double-edged sword, but you can you can hopefully be aware, be weary. I would I, I would say it's a good idea, but just be cautious um, because updating packages on the server, especially just allowing things to auto update could potentially cause cataclysmic events like it could the, the library could break and now the whole thing is broken and it auto updated 100 packages and you don't know which one broke it and now we're in trouble so there is a downside to automatic updates however not updating your servers and leaving vulnerable code running is the one of the major ways that people compromise you so as you can see it's it's kind of weary personally if i was running all of this like if I had if I had a, per, a startup that I was running and I was doing this, I would be running a staging cluster um, and then the prod cluster, staging cluster. The staging cluster would automatically update, and I would have some sort of notification to let me know whenever updates were actually being done. And whenever an update was done, and then we were good with it, what we would do is we would just let it bake for about a week or so, make sure that nothing's breaking, make sure that performance wasn't impacted, and if those auto updates were there, then uh, you can basically you could either manually upgrade uh, the, the the packages inside of the the system. Personally, I wouldn't auto upgrade and just do an apt update because there could have been something that came out in that week that you were waiting on stuff and that could have broke it. So I would probably export the list of all of the packages that are currently installed and their versions, and then I would update that on my prod system. That's just what I would do um, because you all like auto updates are important. You have you need to do them but they also do pose potential risk to production. So you need to very smartly update your servers and having a testing, a staging environment or even a testing environment, whatever you want to call it, is a good way to do that. Um, so what we can use now is we can talk about the auto updates. So Ubuntu has an auto update thing uh, built in and believe it or not, uh, it's already installed. And hopefully I spelled that right on droplets by default. So unattended updates is already installed. Things will automatically, at least on Ubuntu 20.04. I don't remember if it was on 18.04. I don't remember it being on 18.04, but on our Ubuntu 20.04 image, it is automatically installed. And then to edit this, apt, apt.conf.d, uh, 50 unattended upgrades. As you can see, you can see the these are the, the this is the setting for the unattended upgrade. So these are the the ones that we currently allow. So uh, distro ID and distro code name. So that's like what are we on? Like what is this? This isn't Bionic Beaver was 1804, right? We're on something new. I don't know the new. I don't know the distro names anymore. Um, yeah, Bionic was 1804. So we're on something with the C now. Um, I think I don't know. No, it should be, I'm not going to spend that, before. my brain will sit there and figure that out. Okay, so, and then like we want security names, we want app security and security. So basically, we do want security automatic upgrades. We want to make sure that they're okay, that we get all the security patches because this will enable us to not be, um, not be bad. Now, if you did stuff like updates, that's where things are getting a little bit weird because you just could update any package and that could be uh, troublesome. You can also, if you have your own PPAs, and you're doing this, or if you're doing this on uh, Fedora and you have your own RPM source, um, you could totally do this as well, just to make sure that your servers stay are staying secure. So that is unattended upgrades. Next is backup frequently. So I don't actually don't have a demo for this one. Um, so backing up frequently is very important. And the one thing that a lot of people tend to forget or tend to make the mistake is they never test their backups. They never actually ensure that what they have removed, what they have backed up actually can be restored. And a backup that hasn't been tested is a theory. It's not a, it's not a disaster recovery plan. It's a disaster recovery theory. You think it's going to work, but you've never actually tested it. So you should test your backups. You must test your backups because if you wait until the moment that there's a problem to test your backups and the backups don't work, well, now you have two problems and you're going to be at a much more stressed out time because of that. And it's just not like you're not going to have a good time. It's going to be bad. There's going to be a lot of crying. I wouldn't re recommend it. Um, so 
Another question that I often get asked about backups is should I back up offsite? And my answer to this is always yes. Um, there are you you should if, if the platform itself offers backups, which DigitalOcean does do, and I, I will show that in a second. Um, yes, use them. It's great. But like when it comes to cloud providers, everybody in general, when it comes to anybody, never trust anybody with the like don't put your business in the trust of one entity. And only having your backups on one in one place is doing that. So you should very much do backups on the local cloud provider. Uh, because it's going to be easier to restore them from there because it's likely that the cloud provider has provided some way of doing these backups and actually have them work. But if you're actually concerned about that data, you need to be backing it up off site. Um, you never know what could happen. I don't like, I don't have any good stories like around this. Um, I've heard some things on the internet. I'm sure everyone has about people whose backups, uh, they lost access to accounts and their backups get dealt with. And that's just, that's a, bad situation to be in but at the same time if you put all your eggs in one basket and it the basket the bottom falls out the basket and all the eggs breaks yeah the basket's at fault but you're also at fault for not taking care of your business properly um so doing external backups in my opinion is a necessity you must do it uh when it comes to backups on droplets we're just going to pick this one you can enable backups uh and each droplet will cost different amounts depending on how much there are. There's also snapshots, which allow you to basically just take a snapshot of the machine and you can restore the restore the snapshots uh, just like backups. So backups are kind of like more, I would say kind of more infrequent, whereas snapshots you would want to take a little bit more frequently. Um, and backups at, at DigitalOcean only happen once a week. So these are like big, big backups, whereas a snapshot is kind of like a diff in uh in reality so they can take up to one minute per gigabyte of data used by your droplets and then you can restore the snapshots so all DigitalOcean does provide this um pretty much every cloud provider provides this but also the main takeaway from that is also do your own backups it's very important that you do your own backups the last second to last thing we're going to talk about is public key infrastructure and ssl tls so this is essentially a fancy way of saying you need to secure your website and you need to be using HTTPS. Um, this is 2020. In my opinion, there is no excuse for an HTTP server. All traffic across the internet needs to be encrypted. We need to be protecting ourselves. We know that data is harvested by, by uh, apps, by companies, by platforms. We know that this is happening, ISPs, and we know that they are selling it and, you know, there's just all these privacy issues. So in 2020, servers should just be secured by default. That's that's the way it is. Um, there is a reason why you would have like HTTP servers if you're like running stuff inside of a, a VPC and you have SSL termination at the, at the at the barrier where everything is coming in HTTPS and then it's decrypted at the load balancer level and then the internal servers talk HTTP because they're in a secure network and because decrypting SSL is is taxing like it is a it is decryption is never a easy task on a cpu um then there are reasons for it. there's reasons why it's why it's not like just on by default but if it's public facing and you have users using it it needs to be https end of https end of story i would i will i will go on the record and say no exceptions um so to do this and we and honestly back in like the early 2000s mid 2000s even like 2000 11 12 ish this was relatively difficult and expensive you used to have to pay for a certificate and you would get one from somebody and then you had to install it and it was never easy whereas now we have things like um apt we have we have things like cert but i really should have installed this uh cert i should have python 3 dash cert bot dash nginx Uh, do I need to do an apt update? I don't know if I did an apt update whenever I originally did. Oh, it's called Focal, Focal Faucet. That's what the code name of the Ubuntu is. Yeah, so we install certbot, and then we're going to install Python 3 certbot-nginx. But yes, it used to be a lot more difficult to get SSL certificates. Sorry, I get off on my own tangents. Um, than it is now and literally now it's 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 easy like it is 
It's free. You install these packages, CertBot, Python 3, CertBot, Nginx. If you are if you come from Ubuntu 20, 1804, and you're running it on Ubuntu 1304, 20.04, you will, and you try to install Python dash CertBot dash Nginx, it gets really cranky, and now it's Python 3, and that's its own. One must do it as root. As root. Uh, so my email address, Mason at geo.co. I agree. No, I don't want yet another newsletter. Uh, this was called techtalk.shark.codes. So now I'm getting a certificate. It's going to create one for me. And by the way, if you use like PaaS platforms or stuff that do this for you or tools that do this for you, this is exactly what it's doing in the back end. Um, this is the question where it's like, do you want to redirect all your HTTP traffic to HTTPS? Yes, always. Again, it's 2020. So now if I go back to my web browser and I refresh this page, now you can see my connection is secure. It's never been easier to have a secure secure connections on uh, on the internet and the CertBot people are amazing for it. I've seen a couple tech uh, talks from them. I saw one at a conference when they talked about how they built it and it's just absolutely, uh, it's just absolutely amazing stuff. So last one. Isolated execution environments, and I actually don't have a I don't have a demo for this. Um, this is just good. This is just good architecture design. Uh, putting everything in a single server was, I would say that historically that was the way things used to be done. Your database used to live alongside your uh, web server. Like everything used to be on one server. They might be in different virtual machines. They might not be. Whereas uh, in reality, you really don't you don't want that anymore. You want to be able to separate them just as a secure like just as a security risk. Um, your application server might need to face the public internet, but your database server does not. So put the database in a private network and give the application server a way into the network uh, to access the database, but nobody else needs it. That way you're protecting the database. Don't have your database publicly facing the internet. Um, that's just not That's just not good. Like that's, that's asking for trouble. That's really just asking someone to attack the server. Um, same thing with like developer environments now. You should definitely have isolated environments for your developer environments as well as your application servers. You never know when things are going to go cross wires and it's not going to turn out good. So just be be weary of that uh, isolated environments. It also means that if someone compromises the accounts that they only access certain things. There is a concept known as blast radius um, when it comes to architecture design that is around actually having different environments and even different things in different accounts creating multiple accounts and then you know peering them together some ways um and you know through like ipsec or vpc peering or something like that and then that way if someone were to somehow get the credentials to the staging network or to, they would not have access to the prod network so they could destroy stage they could go in they're in the console they could delete everything because they managed to get these credentials it's all fine good and dandy but they're not hurting the production network. So there's just, the more isolation you can put between things, the uh, just in, in general, the secure they're, more secure they're going to be. But at the same time, you also have to remember that security is always a trade-off between convenience and security. And you can eat, when you start doing these isolated environments things, you can definitely make your life very, very, very difficult. Uh, and at some point you have to realize, you have to kind of just take the balance. Do we need this level of isolation versus it takes 20 minutes for our devs to even get anything done, like to log in, this is a problem. You know, you kind of have, it's a, it's a balancing act. There is no right answer. Um, there is the answer that works for you. And with that, that is isolated execution environments. That is all I have for this time. Those are some tips on securing your droplet. Reminder, this tech talk has been recorded and will be emailed to you at do. and also will be on the do.co slash tech talks page. Um, be sure to look out for more webinars and workshops like this. We are I, I'm really enjoying doing the security series. So hopefully uh, next month we will have yet another security series one that will be, you know, just as good. Uh, tune in every last Thursday of the month to watch my webinars. I'm doing security now, but who knows? Maybe I'll do something new in the next couple of months. You never know what I'm going to be doing. Uh, if you're new to DigitalOcean and you would like to try out a free trial program with a new account, their do.co slash Mason will get you $100 free credit for 60 days. And also, Hacktoberfest is coming. It's my favorite event of the year. I'm wearing last year's Hacktoberfest shirt. We have our beautiful new Hacktoberfest logo this year. 
And if you go to hacktoberfest.digitalocean.com, you can sign up for updates. And I hope that everybody will uh, will participate and we'll be looking forward to you know, setting another, hopefully setting another record-breaking year of the amount of contributions to open source that we do during the month of October. And that is all I have. Where is the magic voice in the sky who talks to me about that? There she <laughs> Thank is. you so much, Mason. You have a lot of questions here. Are you okay with going a few minutes over or would you have to go right on the dot? I'm 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 fine. Let's 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 do it. All right. Well, to the audience members, if you can't join us for the full hour here, uh, we'll have the video posted um, and the and, and Mason will answer as many questions as he can look answer live right now. So first question, we got a few questions about this. A lot of people don't want to restart uh, to avoid downtime on their servers. So one, do they need to keep written passwords together with the backups? And two, how do you install a live update package to avoid having to restart after updating the system? Hmm. So some packages on Linux will update without a restart to the system. So most most Linux distros, you don't actually have to like do a full hard restart on the system like you would see in like Windows or something where it is required. Um, there are rare occasions when this needs to happen. Um, I believe kernel updates will trigger this. However, you typically don't update the kernel in a cloud server. Uh, you typically just migrate to a newer one because the way that the way that we had to make Linux work in the cloud, and this goes back to the cloud init stuff, is just we did some things that make doing up doing operating system updates in the cloud beyond difficult. So if you're trying to avoid um, if you're trying to avoid uh, restarts on any service whatsoever, then at that point that's when you need to have more than one. You need to have redundancy in the system. You need to have, I would say, at least three. I, I go with three because you know odd numbers are typically pretty nice. And if there is anything that has to do leader election, like a console server or, or a vault server or anything like that, you need a three so you have a little bit of redundancy and you have it all behind a load balancer and then you update one at a time that's actually what we would do uh at my previous job whenever we had to update the cluster we had we had a it's actually i'm hoping they're eventually going to open source it was a really cool kind of tool it was a locking mechanism tool that would basically get the update create a lock in console which is, if you don't know what console is it's a, a distributed key value store system but basically it's a way of having distributed locks or key values but you can use them for locking and we would lock the server. We would we would say, hey, this server's updating. Nobody else update. And every time that script ran, it would always try. Somebody would try to attain the lock. So we made sure that we only updated one server at a time. Therefore, yes, there will be a little bit of downtime, but the load balancer should detect this, and uh, it should detect this. And if there is going to be downtime, because again, a lot of services don't always need downtime to update. Um, but if there is downtime, a load balancer should detect it and it should reroute the traffic. Therefore, your users will see no downtime, but you may have some downtime on the back end. But at the end of the day, this is planned downtime. This is planned outages. That is um, that is what happened. What did you say about the passwords, Samantha? Um, do we need to keep written passwords together with the backups? <sighs> Password management is so so difficult um i could do a tech talk on that if they're written make sure that there's like in a vault somewhere um or in your head or in a password manager some like there's 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 tool actually a tool called vault that you can use this um however don't write them and put them on a sticky note on your desk at work however a small book of passwords that is in your house is theoretically safer than just like sticking them somewhere you know like in a google drive or in like you know don't don't commit them to github um because the amount of people that are going to break into your house and steal your magic book of passwords is relatively low um i it's hard to advocate for or against written passwords i have a book of passwords but my book of passwords is typically account name my username and then a hint so maybe you could do that uh that one's tough that like there are my my personal opinion Avoid written passwords if you can. Try to use a, a password manager like Vault or like Bit or not Bitly, uh, a, 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 a LastPass or One Password or something like that. But if you are going to write passwords down, don't just blatantly write it out. Try if it is like a like a try to give yourself some hints. Maybe intentionally put something in there wrong that you know is going to be wrong, um, or hand encrypt it with something like make it difficult. Like find a way to deter people from figuring it out. I could go on about that for hours, so we'll just go to the next question. I hope that helped. 
All right, which web server is more secure, Apache, Nginx, or Lighty? And is Nginx the most abused server? Do I need Nginx for security? Ooh. So one, I've actually never heard of Lighty, so now I have something to do whenever I'm done. Um, I've only ever used Apache or Nginx. Um, to my knowledge, they're both very secure. Nginx became popular because of its, um, because of its, it was touting itself as a micro web web server, whereas Apache is a lot. There's a lot of stuff in Apache, um, and Nginx also used to be. I mean, I would say they're probably still secure. I have no idea about the security of Nginx right now as it is, but it used to be the default server in OpenBSD. And the OpenBSD folks are super concerned about uh, security. Now, they eventually got cranky with Nginx and went and wrote their own because that's what OpenBSD does. Um, but it is, I would say they're both relatively secure uh, servers. I don't think, I think that, people gravitate towards nginx because of the lightweightness of using it but apache is still a good server like vir virtual hosts are still very powerful they're both still very secure um needing one for for security purposes uh it's never a bad idea to do stuff behind like a reverse proxy and stuff to do that kind of like protection of your services um but i would never necessarily mandate that you need one i mean that's again it's always security and layers and uh yeah, and they're both good. I would I don't I don't know if one is inherently better than the other. It really I think at this point it's come down to a personal preference. I just think that Nginx Nginx runs nicer in a Docker file and I think that's why it's getting a lot of the the attention is because because it's micro and because Docker is also supposed to be a microservice that Nginx popularity has exploded and it's kind of in my I I see a lot more Nginx in the wild than I see Apache now. So, yeah. Cool. These are, these are interesting questions. I have to really think about them. <laughs> nice. I want to keep my droplets secure with an SSH port other than port 22. How do you change port 22 to another SSH port? It's in the open SSH config settings. Um, I, Samantha, can you put that question in the document that I usually answer and I will actually get, uh, like I will actually send that setting. I don't know it off the top of my head and I don't really want to Google while I'm doing this, but it is, it's in uh, Etsy, oh, Etsy SSH open SSH D underscore config. Um, and underscore conf or configure conf, and uh, it is yes, it's very it's very simple to change the port that SSH listens to. I think it's one of the first things in the SSH file. And then whenever you do actually SSH in, you would do SSH. You're almost up, and then you do dash p, and then you do the port number, and then you can do it. That is a a, a method. Some people do that because uh, you know a lot of the, the things on the internet are bots, and they don't really bots don't have a brain. So yes, that is it's an it's an obfuscation technique which. Do, it, yeah, I mean, it's one more thing to confuse people. If it works, it's valid, in my opinion. So, yeah, it's an easy setting config. It's an easy change. It's a single line change in the SHD config. Cool. We'll post the resources for you on the Tech Talk page. What do you recommend for DDoS attacks? Cloudflare. <laughs> um, So I'm not going to claim to be an expert in knowing how to stop DDoS attacks, um, but Cloudflare protects it and they do a amazing job. And it's a hard question to solve. DDoS is like when you have deny dynamic denial of service versus just denial of service. So denial of service is like you know it could be one or two people trying to to attack you, and they're relative. That's relatively easy because you can just ban their IP address. So something like fail to ban would handle a DOS attack. A, 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 a sorry denial of service attack and there's other different types of denial of service attacks um it also depends on what servers you're running like if you're running a dns server and you're getting dns reflection attacks then maybe don't run an authoritative server maybe run a like run a run a, a read-only server just there's there's so much there's so many different denial of service attacks um that it's difficult now when it comes to dynamic and you don't really like you have a botnet attacking you and the, the ip addresses are coming from all around the world that's very very difficult to uh, defend from, and I have no idea how to do that. And the people at Cloudflare have done a genius job of doing it. So honestly, like when it comes to that level, that's very difficult security theory to get into. Um, it's not something that I would say that I'm at all qualified to even speak about. And that's and that's where, as a programmer myself, don't reinvent the wheel and try to do something that other people have perfected, especially when they it's relatively cheap to use. I would use Cloudflare personally. Um, I don't. 
don't re don't implement things that are not your core business. Like that's that's a trap that a lot of companies get into, and we saw I've seen it at big companies, I've seen it at small companies. You're like, oh well, I'll just implement this myself because I want to. No, no, no. Like, are are you selling that product you're implementing? Are you selling DDoS protection? If you are, great, implement it. But if you're not, you're wasting engineering resources trying to implement something that already exists that other people could help you that people could probably do better versus focusing your time on the things that make you money, the things that are growing your business, things that some people would say, especially the C-levels would say, matter more than just building your own little DDoS protection. So uh, long story short, I would use Cloudflare. That's just me. All right. This is a question about backups. Do you have okay. any cost-saving tips for backups? Mm. That one's a little bit tough. You need to determine how often you need to backup. And if there's a way you can do a backup that only ba only backup directories that you need, um, getting a server back into the right state is not terribly difficult. Um, so like updating it, like there's tools like Terraform and Ansible that do this for us. So you don't need to uh, like backup like the packages, or like, or like the Etsy directory where everything gets installed. Now, if you modified a config file, yes, very much so you need to backup that. So being very selective with your backups, um, how long you keep your backups. Now, if it's historical data that you know you need to keep, that I mean, that's just going to be expensive. Like if you have to keep the database backup from the end of time, from the beginning of time, that's fine. Then that's, that's going to be it. But if you don't need that historical data, um, then backing it up, then de deleting older backups, only keeping a backup for, you know, saying, I'm, we only keep backups for a year. Any information before that is will be lost. And stating that very specifically, like users will, that, that, that you might need, you just, that might need to be in your SLOs somewhere that we only keep data for so long. Or what you do is eventually you archive data. So back, keeping backups inside of say, DigitalOcean, uh, will eventually accumulate money and cost money. So you would, I would say you would probably have like a rotation policy there, like only the last six months in DigitalOcean, but then make sure, um, like you should also be doing external backups, but build yourself a storage array and keep those backups if you need that data. Don't try to keep your entire archive in the cloud because that will become very expensive. Try to create an in-person archive um, and use, try to use file systems that are, that are friendly to this, like file systems like ZFS or BTRFS. Um, I don't know if BTRFS does copy on write. I know ZFS does. Um, but just utilizing file system tricks and stuff are also uh, relatively helpful with that as well. So I would say just develop a policy of how long you want to keep it and, and stick to it. And if you need that data, then find a cheaper way of archiving it um, onto, I mean, heck, external, I've got external hard drives. Like literally sitting at my desk next to me of, of data that I don't need anymore, but for historical purposes, I keep it. Um, and you could just do that in that, that point. Like this is four terabytes. Yeah, I would say that that's, that's, that's my best advice. Backups, unfortunately, are always expensive. There's, it's, it's not a, it's not a cheap thing to do. And I don't know of anybody that's doing it cheaply right now. I'm seeing a lot of questions about backups. Sounds like we might want to do another tech talk just about backups itself. I'll ask one more question about this. Okay. Um, do you recommend a way package or a software service to do backups outside of the hosting service used for the project? And do you backup a server image or only the data to recover? Ooh, man, these are good. You're right. I mean, we should definitely write down notes that we want to do. We want to do <laughs> we a have, We have so many great questions. Thank you to the audience for asking That's them fantastic. and we'll do yeah, follow-ups. Back, I mean, back, backups are, a, you know, it's a very hot topic because like it's, it's that, it, it, it's the life preserver of your, of your company and you get worried uh, about it. So backing up to, so the question was asking about like specific services or, um, or do I back up the whole image? Ooh. If the image is special, then I would say keep either keep a copy of it or I mean I used to build all of my images with Packer. So I and we kept our Packer version our Packer files were versioned in source control. So if I needed to get like 3 years ago image, I technically could rebuild that image as long as the the distros haven't been taken down. So you do have to kind of worry about as time expands, um repos eventually go away. 
packages major security vulnerabilities come out like that one that happened in docker about a year ago and then it becomes impossible to get those old packages anymore because they removed them so you don't have to worry about that i would say if you have a one if you have a golden image that you're worried about keep a copy of it i mean it, hopefully it shouldn't be more than like three or four gigs if it is, then maybe you want to consider what really needs to be in that image versus what can be done with configuration management after the image is stood up. Um, so there's that. As for tooling to get stuff off of servers, um, believe it or not, rsync is a great option. Like rsync, do, rsync is just this ancient Unix tool that does all of the great things. There are backup services you can pay for. Um, I've actually don't know which ones I've ever used, to be honest. I used to know about Tarsnap, um, but that's more like a personal thing. Um, but yeah, rsync is great. There are other types. That's actually all I can think of. That's all I've ever really seen anybody use. Like even at, at both of my jobs, we rsync stuff off that we rsync valuable data off the servers if we needed it, um, just to another server. I'm sure that there are options out there. Uh, I would have to actually do a little bit more research to see who's doing what in that space. But yeah, rsync. It's it, 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 believe it or not, a lot of times we like to make things overly complicated. Some of the some of the best tools in in the industry are these old Unix tools that nobody's had to touch in 30 years because they just work. And rsync is definitely one of them. That's all the time we have for questions today. Remember, security happens in layers. It's not just one thing. It's not one firewall. It's not one VPC. It's all of these things being brought together that will make your infrastructure secure. Thank you for tuning in. Now go and secure everything, and I hope I'll see you again soon.